five, four, three, two, one. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to February 4, 2021. Uh, goal setting workshop for the city of Brisbane. This is a city council special meeting agenda. Uh, it is Thursday, um, Thursday, it is Thursday, February 4th, 2021. Um, city clerk, please read the pre preamble. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This meeting is compliant with the governor's executive order N-29-20 issued on March 17th, 2020, allowing for deviation of teleconference rules required by the Brown the purpose of this is to provide the safest environment for staff, council members, and the public while allowing for public participation. The public may address the council using exclusively remote public comment options. The council may take action on any item listed in the agenda. Public meeting videos. Members of the public may view the city council meetings by logging into the Zoom webinar with the information I'll provide below. City council meetings can also be viewed live and or on demand via the city's YouTube channel www.youtube.com forward slash Brisbane CA or on Comcast channel 27. Archive videos can be replayed on the city's website at brisbaneca.org forward slash meetings. To address the council, members of the public may view the city council meeting by logging into the Zoom webinar below. The city council meeting will be an exclusively virtual <coughs> meeting. The city council agenda materials may be viewed online at www.brisbaneca.org at least 24 hours prior to a special meeting and at least 72 hours prior to a regular meeting. Meeting participants are encouraged to submit public comment in writing in advance of the meeting. Aside from commenting while in the Zoom webinar, the following email and text line will also be monitored during the meeting and public comments received will be read into the, into the record during the item. Email ipad at brisbaneca.org, text 628-219-2922, join the Zoom webinar, at 979-6803-1943 with the passcode 123456 and the call-in number at 1669-900-9128. All attendees using this webinar um, feature are muted by default. Um, to speak, press the raise your hand icon and you will be called on at the appropriate time. If you're joining us via telephone to indicate you want to provide public comment, press star nine to raise your hand. When called upon, please state your name and provide your comments. You can also provide your comment using the Q&A function in the webinar. And for special assistance, please contact the city clerk at 415-508-2113. Notification in advance of the meeting will enable the city to make reasonable arrangements to ensure accessibility to this meeting. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize for our, our late start. Uh, if we could have a report out from our closed session. Tommy there. Oh, there. Same, there are same problems before uh, the connections week. Okay. Uh, during closed session, the Council took up the one item on the Housing Authority agenda and gave direction to staff on how to proceed. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sorry for the inconvenience the other way. No, no problem. Thanks, Tom. Um, so item one, uh, 750 cold order, that's okay. The con item two, consent calendar items. <laughs> item A, adopt resolutions number 2021 through 04 through 2021-19 to appoint members of the Parks and Recreation Commission, Planning Commission, Public Arts Committee, Complete Street Safety Committee, and the Open Space and Ecology Committee. I'd like to pull the consent item A. Okay. And, and the reason why I'll just dive right in um, is that on the appointments for the Open Space and Ecology Committee for a shortened term through January 2022, that's giving them less than one year on that and our application process said for two years. So I would like to make it for a two year appointment if that's possible. 
Okay, so, if I may. Yes, please. Um, the, the actual posting was from um, was for a short term through January 2022. It was a um, uh, I think it, we just misspoke because we had posted the the terms for you know since last year so it was technically a two-year term but since it took a year to actually make the appointments it got it was you know it was really just a shortened shortened term for one year is it possible for us to make that a two-year term i think that um with someone new coming in it's hard to even get up to speed in the first 11 months and it really isn't even a two year or a one year term at this point. And I think that it would be better to be a term through January 23. That, we, that means we have to interview again. And Well, uh, if, if I may, um, can we get a comment from either Clay or Tom? Because typically if we have an administrative issue, uh, we can rectify that and we do not have to re-interview people who have already been appointed. In the past, we have just reappointed people without interviews, if that is our desire. Um, but I will defer to Clay or Tom to how to rectify this, please. You, you, could, you could do it that way. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, the city clerk is is correct. We this is a two year appointment. It's just that it took a year to get the the appointment process and up to gear. So um, we could, uh, you know, I mean, I, I think the cleanest way to make sure your kind of appointment rotation stays in place is to come at the end of the year and do at the, Ingrid. At that point, it would the next upping would be like for a four year appointment, right? Correct. It's because yeah. this is for the replacement of the committee members who had resigned and their terms ended in 2022. Yeah, if, if, you, if you were to do two years tonight, we, then we would just have kind of a, a mess. Uh, I believe, mess. That, I believe <laughs> yeah. that's not part of the bylaws, um, current, the current bylaws. Then, yeah, so I mean, my, my recommendation would be just go ahead with the appointment as you've done it tonight. We'll come back at the end of the year. And then if you, if you want to, at that point, say, Look at these folks have only had one year. We don't really need to re-interview them. We're just going to reappoint them. You can, you could do that. You, you've done something similar to that in the past. Okay, and and if I may, um, just so the public knows, we never appoint. We have never in the history of Brisbane appointed people to committees or commissions, but we have reappointed them. In, in the past, and I, I don't have the details of that, but so it is. It See, without is, interviews? With, with no interviews. So if people are already on a committee, we can just reappoint. So to keep it clean, if that's okay, um, Terry, that we proceed in that manner, I think that would be the cleanest way for us to do it. And I certainly do not want to think that we've got new people who have just been appointed that think they're gonna be re-interviewed in a year because that would not be okay. But legally, don't you have to notice it and allow a, other community members to apply? So there could be somebody else that applies and we would, in all fairness, need to interview everyone. Well, you know, rather than trying to figure this out tonight, let maybe the city attorney and city clerk and I can get together and, and get some information out to you in terms of what your options are at the end of the year. I think my my big thing is that Glenn had mentioned that she was going to be retiring and moving and that she saw that happening two years being the right amount of time, but four years being too much. So if we do a one year appointment now and we go to extend her, well, now that term is now four years and that's no longer fits in her timeline anymore. So that's that's like another th another thing that's kind of weird about this because she was going and thinking it's two, but it's really gonna be one and then four if we decide to reappoint, which is well over her, her time allotment. Madam Mayor. Yes, Tom. So um, legally you, you've got three issues here. You have um, the disclosure of two, that these were two year terms and um, it turns out not to be two year terms is an administrative mistake and in, particularly in this time with the pandemic, 
uh, anybody trying to enforce that in court is going to probably have a very angry judge. Um, in but terms, Tom, Tom, can I can I jump in here for a second? It, it wasn't an administrative mistake. It was posted correctly and announced correctly. Mm -hmm. I think what happened is that when we did the interviews last week, we were referring to it as two years. When it was when it's it is technically a two year appointment. It yeah. was just there's only one year left. But in terms of how it was posted by the city clerk. I um, mean, the communication uh, from the city clerk, that was all all accurate. So, so there, there was no administrative mistake. Uh, let me let me finish here because I well, okay. we'll, we'll leave that there. The, the terms, you are finishing terms that are provided for in the Brisbane Code, and therefore you have to stick to those terms unless you notice a meeting and you changed the, the code through the normal channels, et cetera. Um, so you couldn't do it tonight anyway. Um, and you can't do it the next meeting, the way the, uh, the rules need to be applied. So you'd have to notice it, propose an amendment, put it before the, the, the public, take it up a second time, et cetera. Um, and that gets me to the third point. The, at the end of the day, uh, there is nothing that requires you to say tonight, we will guarantee a reappointment or not. You can just know that the, the sense of the council is we don't want to have asked people to do a two year term and because of the pandemic and delays, have them only serve nine months, but we'll revisit it um, in, the, uh, in the fall as is the normal way and decide then, as uh, the city manager said, decide then what your options are. And we can provide the options sooner, but you're juggling three different things. My point, Madam Clerk, on the administrative error was simply to say that if somebody read it today, they wouldn't have the full context. That's what I was getting at. But no judge would, a judge would be angry if you tried to argue that to them, that you were wasting the court's time. Uh, and then um, if I may, Madam Mayor, um, you know, we have people who, um, you know, who, who we appoint and then for whatever reason, they have to leave. Just because they're on a advisory body doesn't mean that they are obligated to stay, right? So if, say if Glenn wanted to leave after a couple of years, if we did appoint her to a four-year term, she, she, she could do that. And she's already put in a, so much, you know, valuable time to this community on that body, um, you know. That, that, that's also an option too, so. But tonight you have not noticed, um, what, what's noticed is a routine, uh, the, the two year appointments were filling them out. They were noticed properly that way. The, the only possible error is a misunderstanding by somebody reading it currently as opposed to somebody reading the, the record. Uh, again, there's not gonna be a legal issue there. Um, nobody's gonna, it, it, as I said, it would anger people. I think you need to act tonight or not uh, on what's before you. This is this is too material of a change not to have noticed it in advance. Right. And I do, City Manager, I now understand what you were referring to. Yes, legally, they are two-year terms. You're right. They were always said to be two-year terms. I meant that they may have been misbred by somebody reading today. I get your point, though. You're right. Legally, that's right. Right. I'll make a motion if uh, that's okay to uh, adopt resolutions number 2021 through 04. Or, no, excuse me, numbers 2021 04 through 2021 19. I will second that. I'll call vote. Um, Council Member Davis? Aye. Council Member Lentz? Aye. Council Member Mackin? Aye. Council Member O'Connell? Aye. Mayor Cunningham? Aye. Thank you, everyone. I, I'm really sorry for the confusion, too. I mean, you know, this last year has had so many curveballs thrown at us that I'm just so impressed that everybody's basically on the same page. Thank you. Okay, moving on to our 
Item three, our goal setting workshop. Uh, we'll start with um, uh, item B, the 2020 year end summary, and then we'll get into item C, the goal setting workshop. Clay. Hey, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, we're gonna start off with the, uh, the um, a little presentation on um, kind of reminding us all of the things that we've done through the, uh, the past year. Um, and uh, Caroline has put together a uh, presentation on that. So I'm gonna turn it over to her and uh, she'll make the presentation. If there's any questions that the council members have uh, with regards to what's being presented um, or you know, additional information, we can get all the department heads here tonight. So we can certainly answer any of the questions that might come up. Hey, thank you, Clay. I'm gonna share my screen. Can you all see the 2020 highlights? Yes. Okay, great. All right, so good evening, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. I have the pleasure of presenting at the start of your goal setting workshop, a look back at an anything but ordinary year. 2020 seemed to start like any, an, any other normal year, but on March 13th, just to set the tone, uh, representatives from the chamber, the city, and the Lions Club, as uh, Councilmember Lentz, Davis, the city manager, deputy city manager, myself, Dan Carter, John Mazza, Sharon Boggs, and her pup got together to discuss setting up the Brisbane COVID-19 Response Coalition to make sure that no Brisbane residents fell through the cracks. The Village Helping Hands would also get involved and volunteer their time, taking down messages for residents needing assistance getting groceries, a ride to their doctors. And BCRC is still assisting residents and was one of the first, if not the first, to be implemented of its kind in the county. And we all know that on Monday, March 16th, that was the date of the Bay Area's first shelter in place order, which changed the trajectory of the year, how we did our work and how we would serve the community. I just wanted to um, provide that example because that really um, sets the tone for the rest of the presentation and how the partnerships were formed at the onset to carry us through the year. So going into the 2020 highlights, they're categorized here by council adopted values. So you can see what was still able to happen in an anything but ordinary year. So let's get started with the first value or using the terminology of priority based budgeting, the first result, safe community. So a safe community is that residents and visitors will experience a sense of safety. The police department completed a technology upgrade of their mobile car computers, which now allows officers to write the reports in their vehicles, thus spending more time visible out in the community than in the station. Officers attended and prepared an operation plan in partnership with the event coordinators for a Black Lives Matter peaceful demonstration event at the community park to ensure safety for all attendees, which was well attended and very peaceful. Police and fire sent, sent personnel and mutual aid requests to the multiple major wild incidents throughout California to assist with residential evacuations and structure protection. North County Fire Authority updated the evacuation plan for Brisbane, as well as coordinated with the county on moving forward with an online countywide electronic platform slated to be operational in 2021. Firefighters continued safety inspections of land parcels throughout the vegetation abatement and management program as well as completed annual life safety and fire code compliance inspections and plan check reviews. The Department of Public Works, now on referred to as DPW, finished the water main replacement project phase two, improving fire flow and water pressure for the upper streets of Kings, Margaret, Paul, and Harold. DPW installed a retaining wall on the 400 block of Kings mitigating concerns for a failing slope. This work was completed on December 3rd, just ahead of the winter rains. And DPW also made safety improvements on Guadalupe Canyon Parkway, which included modified striping plans and added rumble strips to prevent shoulder runoffs and median head-on accidents. As part of the Safe Routes Schools project, DPW oversaw improvements along the city's official walk routes 
which were chosen based on sidewalk clearance, visibility, and observed walking trends. The improvements included new curb ramps, restriping in intersections with high visibility piano key style crosswalks, adding related signage, and insetting wayfinding markers along the walk routes to schools. The walk routes are intended to provide designated routes for students, families, and other pedestrians to get around central Brisbane on foot as safely and comfortably as possible. On several street segments near BES and Littman, a new 15 per hour speed limit will be in effect only when children are present at the start and end of the school day. So now we're going to move on to community building, which is that Brisbane will honor the rich diversity of our city, which are residents, organizations, and businesses through community engagement and participation. Brisbane Parks and Recreation Department was one of the very first agencies in the county and state to launch their virtual recreation platform in response to the pandemic. The Smile Brisbane campaign sought to achieve much more than online class resources and activity ideas for Brisbane residents. Smile Brisbane is an initiative focused on continued service to residents intending to combat social isolation, engage with community, address food insecurity, support community health and wellness, and unify residents during this trying time. The Parks and Recreation Department has received two awards from the California Parks and Recreation Society for the Smile Brisbane campaign in their Solidarity poster series. Nine city events and programs were reimagined last year so that they could be experienced safely while also bringing a semblance of normalcy to community members as well as share important resources. They were senior lunches where with the help of the Lions Club and Samaritan House were distributed not just once, but twice a week via drive through pickup and delivery to those that needed assistance. And that persists today. The Luna Fest Film Festival, which was held virtually, raised more than $24,000 and 13 young women pursuing careers in male dominated fields were awarded scholarships by the Brisbane Lions Club, a key event partner with 2020 being no different. Three, a socially distanced Easter egg hunt where paper eggs were posted up around town and a map was provided for those hunting. Successful hunters took a photo with the eggs and tagged us using the hashtag SmileBrisbane. Four, the city's traditional fire hydrant painting and restoration event, which was moved to the fall, allowed residents the opportunity to par participate in a socially distanced event while flexing their creativity muscles and sprucing up some hydrants. Five, during October, which is Fire Prevention Month, crews with communication staff recorded a series of story time at Station 81 videos, where in lieu of in-person tours and the NCFA Fire Service Day or annual open house event, crews read stories, provided safety tips, and had the fire engine on display. Six, as part of Spooktober, treat bags were prepared and distributed during a farmer's market with the cornhole board set up near the gazebo. Players were provided with their own bean bags to toss and take home. Seven, the Veterans Day flag raising ceremony was live streamed from the park with former council member Clark Conway on site along with our officers and a handful of community members. Eight, a library dedication ceremony was held and also live streamed from the new 163 visitation site where the full city council as well as County Supervisor David Canapa and former Supervisor Adrian Tissier were in attendance for the special occasion. And lastly, the Festival of Lights was recorded using several mobile devices and streamed via Zoom on the city's YouTube channel and Comcast channel 27. It included a car light parade through town for residents to take in from the safety of their homes, along with the traditional tree lighting by volunteers of the year, Vicki Lewis, Joe Silly, and Mayor O'Connell, North Pole Parcels for Purchase, which sold out, a virtual visit from Santa and Leanne Borghese singing all the songs and more that the traditional carolers would have when coming down visitation. And now IT staff also converted the city to Microsoft or Office 365 to ensure employees could stay connected offsite and set up a system to ensure that employees can work remotely by providing laptops, cell phones and log me in connections. At a time when many cities were putting website redesigns on the back burner, we felt that it was crucial for ours to proceed forward, knowing that many residents would be visiting the site for local information and resources concerning the pandemic. Staff completed the redesign in the spring with Minicode for less than 15,000, whose services we happen to be already using for housing the city's municipal code. We now have a more streamlined meeting and agenda management system, mobile-friendly mobile website, 
and the Municipal Code Library with further cross enhancements easily possible in the future. Also realizing that we would be conducting virtual meetings well into the year, staff made it a priority to address the background buzzing on channel 27. The issue was resolved with staff troubleshooting along with MCTV from the city council chambers. Another item that was able to be upgraded free of cost was the video quality of meetings and events shown on our YouTube channel. We began streaming meetings directly from Zoom to YouTube in the fall, which has allowed for sharper HD quality video without that nascent buzz. The, the difference can be seen starkly on our YouTube channel, Brisbane CA. I will move on to fiscally prudent, which is that Brisbane's fiscal vitality will reflect reflect sound decisions, which also speak to the values of the community. The finance department prepared a high level two-year budget for fiscal years 2020, 2021, and 2021, 2022, which the council adopted on June 4th, meeting the June 30th deadline. The budgets for both years are balanced within the available resources. Finance staff also tracked expenditures for COVID-19 in order to apply for reimbursement from the state and federal government when possible. The city's community development department now referred to as CDD obtained a funding grant for 215,000 to assist in implementing state housing requirements. DPW also received over $245,000 from the city and county association of governments to help complete the combined safe route to schools green infrastructure project. More on that in a bit. Thanks for a mix of businesses in town being more construction related and businesses that sell products to other businesses or B2B versus businesses that sell finished products and services directly to consumers or B2C such as shopping malls. Sales tax, which is the city's largest revenue source is up about 1 million more than what the finance director would have anticipated. And as a direct result of COVID, Brisbane became a larger percentage of the county's overall sales tax collection. Normally, we're about 3% of the county's overall sales tax, but in recent quarters, we've been closer to 5 to 6%. Another area we've been doing better is in property tax, where the city is up $400,000 more than what was anticipated due to the new construction happening at zero point. Staff was very conservative in making their projections and hadn't projected any increases in this area due to not being sure how COVID would affect property taxes. You're probably aware that property taxes get paid to a variety of agencies of which the city is one. We receive approximately 20% of the property tax paid for on a house. With construction being deemed an essential business, it was able to be continued after just a short delay at the start of the pandemic with the healthcare campuses coming along nicely as you may have noticed when visiting the Brisbane Marina. Okay, ecological sustainability. That Brisbane will be a leader in setting policies and practicing service delivery innovations that promote ecological sustainability. A case in point is that the city received the REACH Code Award for Innovation from Sustainable San Mateo County for adoption of local green building codes, allowing for safer and more comfortable buildings, increased EV charging infrastructure, and reduced emissions. The Open Space and Ecology Committee hosted Brisbane's first recycled arts and crafts contest. Nearly 30 community members submitted their projects, highlighting reuse opportunities and demonstrating that one man's treasure, one man's treasure can truly be another's. One man's trash can truly be another man's treasure. As part of the Safe Routes to Schools project was a green infrastructure component. This included implementing bioretention basins or bioswales that use native and drought tolerant plants to help treat stormwater. These basins were installed at various locations along the walk routes and serve a dual purpose, stormwater capture and flood prevention, as well as safer interse intersections by way of the bulb outs, which provide for safer crossings and greater visibility into the intersections used frequently for walking to school. A mature bioswale can be seen at City Hall where adjacent to the parking lot is one of the county's first demonstration projects, which is also shown here. DPW began the implementation phase of the Brisbane Building Efficiency Program, which was created in 2019 to help make local buildings more energy and water efficient, as well as curb emissions driving climate change. Most owner, owners of local buildings, 10,000 square feet or more, must benchmark their building and report results to the city annually starting May 15, 2021. 
By right, food service distributors became the first building to do so in November of last year by completing their compliance effort. The Baylands continues to be a major project of the city. We work diligently throughout the year safeguarding the city's position on environmental and legal issues, including all aspects of density, cleanup, remediation, and the financial impacts of growth. The city's comments on the draft feasibility study or remedial action plan for OU2 and OUSM were submitted to the State Water Board and Department of Toxic Substances Control as part of the agency's public comment period for the plans and can be found on our website. The city also firmly opposed the California High Speed Rail Authority's proposal to locate a rail yard in Brisbane, providing extensive comments as did many of our citizens and other groups. We are waiting now for those comments to be addressed in any final EIR and planning documents by the authority. The city's full response can also be found on our website, brisbaneca.org. And lastly, economic development. Brisbane will work with the businesses and residents to provide for economic vitality and diversity. The Community Development Department implemented an enhanced and expanded range of online customer services, including planning submittals and building permit processing from the city's new website. With Help Peaks, the shore nearing completion on Sierra Point Parkway, DBW is overseeing project compliance, including their design and installation of offsite improvements such as a new sewer line in Sierra Point Parkway and sewer lift station number four. With phase three's Genesis Marina project breaking ground at nearby 3500 Marina Boulevard, DPW and CDD staff confirmed that the project complies with requirements of the development agreement and mitigation and monitoring reporting plan. Out at 501 Tunnel, DPW participated in a bi county review of the planned major remodel at the Recology facility. And lastly, the city continues to subsidize G3, a community-led group for the purchase of supplies from Brisbane Hardware for all their beautification efforts done along our downtown drag, Visitation Ave, whose holiday decorations brought a lot of joy and cheer to our local restaurants, businesses, as well as community members. So that concludes my presentation of the 2020 highlights, which I hope helps you, the city council, and those watching to see a bit more of how we've been keeping plenty busy. And if you wanted to delve deeper, they're also in your packet and on the website as um, lists group by department. So there's more that you can look at there. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions or turn it over to Clay for your next portion of the evening's agenda. Thank you, Caroline. <laughs> you, you're amazing. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, any, any questions for Caroline before we move on? No? Madam Mayor, we have a um, raised hand from Linda Detmer. Please go ahead. Okay, I'm, I need to promote her to panelists in order for her to be able to. Linda, you need to un unmute yourself. I see you now, but you're muted. Yeah. I don't know if this is an appropriate time to make a comment or should I wait until public comments? About what? Uh, the stuff that was just discussed by Caroline. Uh, that was a lot of stuff. Anything in particular? Complete streets. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, it'd probably be best to just uh, wait until it's agendized for the next, when, once it's all presented. So I believe the city manager is. If you wouldn't mind, Linda, we're going to wait for this, okay? Yeah, it would be fine. Thank you so much. Colleen looked like she had her hand raised to say something. Uh, this, um, just so you guys know, I can only see so many people on this screen. Uh, so, and Colleen, I don't see your hand raised. Can you use for this new format on the bottom of your screen there's a hand raise um it's a little yellow thingy because if you it, now i can see it okay all right thanks colleen go and, and if ever, everybody would please be patient this is a a new format and if i screw up don't kill me okay go ahead go ahead colleen 
those raised hands are hard to see, by the way. Yeah. I, I was just going to point out, it, interesting, thank you, Caroline, for the presentation that, that um, I didn't hear mention, it's funny that Linda's in here, I didn't hear mention of complete streets. And I just wanted to point out that all of that about the safe route, it's not just the route when you talked about crosswalk signage, markers, curb ramps, and even the speed limits, that was all of their work. And I didn't hear mention of their committee and I think they deserve that recognition. So I just wanna put in the word there. That that's a lot of hours of work that all of those improvements came about. And that's the cat in the background echoing the same as what I just said. Thank you. Um, do I see any more raised hands for comments? Um, I think we'll wait until public comment for the public. Okay, I... So, I, I see nothing here, right, okay, so this is new to me, so we're moving on now, Ingrid, you need to help me out here, this is, this is new. Madam Mayor, we're going into the council goal setting portion of the meeting. Okay, all right, so, okay, because I, I didn't see the other, thank you. So we're moving on now to the goal setting workshop, item C, council goal setting. Item I, 2021 goal setting. Okay, um, I think Ingrid, we're gonna put something up on the screen. Can you see the goal setting list of projects? Yes, I can. Yep. So we've listed out a number of projects um, or items that we know will be coming forward to the council in some fashion in the, um, in the next year. Um, and they're kind of um, somewhat of a, of a kind of a hodgepodge of different items and stuff. So I'll kind of go through those fairly quickly. The whole point of tonight is, you know, you could certainly ask questions about any of these um, or make suggestions in terms of how we approach them. Um, and then if there's things the council wants to add, and it's, uh, it's really just a kind of a, a to-do list for us throughout the year uh, so that we um, kind of make sure that we don't miss the things that are important for, uh, to the council members in terms of um, getting them um, done and brought forward. So the first one is um, SB 1383, which is a, a state bill um, or wide range of bills to reduce organics and into the waste and landfills. Um, the Public Works Department has been working on this. We actually had a subcommittee meeting um, and got some direction from the subcommittee a couple of weeks ago. Um, and then this will be uh, coming forward to the council um, probably late winter, early spring of this year. The uh, second item um, uh, I put on here with a little bit of hesitation, but I know it's an important um, item to a couple of council members. And the only hesitation is that we're still working through um, the um, tariff issues in terms of what we can do with the polls um, in terms of uh, the, the lighting and uh, seeing if we can get uh, the, the, the lights up for the, for the holidays. This year, we did kind of a hybrid project, um, some volunteers, which included a couple of your um, council members um, got involved and in, uh, did some um, uh, mock-ups uh, for the polls on uh, visitation. And then we had a contractor uh, implement the, the, the rest of that. Um, but we are working on that. It's on our radar screen and if we can get it accomplished, we will, we will do so. Um, the next item was one that was unfortunately a, a really a, 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 um, a casualty of COVID-19. Uh, we were going to be bringing forward in next last year's budget or the current year's budget that we're in, but for last year for approval, a series of um, projects and uh, um, funding for um, basically beautification of the community, everything from reducing um, weeds doing more uh, weed uh, pulling to um, plantings in certain areas. Um, unfortunately, this all got derailed uh, when we, um, because of the concerns over the, uh, the budget, 
Um, so we're going to be reevaluating this as, as uh, Caroline got into a little bit with the, the finances. The, um, one of the odd things, I guess, about COVID-19 is that we were really, um, I think all state local governments were really expecting to get hammered uh, financially when the COVID-19 started. Um, the, the notion of shutting down the economy, I think, was, uh, was scary on a number of fronts and certainly scary for us in terms of fucking our finances. Um, but a number of revenues have come in a much, much stronger. So um, we're in a much better condition than uh, I would have thought we would have been in, or Stuart would have thought we would have been last uh, March or April when we were putting together the budget. So I think there is some potential for bringing some of this back to the council for consideration and implementation this year. Um, the next item is the uh, project up in the lower acres. The planning department had had a couple of meetings before the planning commission to um, identify um, road plan lines. That's not to build a road, or building a road. Um, it comes with uh, the develop, development if it indeed happens. Um, we've uh, continuously emphasized that there are no applications on file, continues to be the case. Um, but this is a uh, orderly way of um, um, planning and, and getting out in front of some potential issues in, into the future. So this is being handled by the community development uh, department. Uh, the next um, phase of this would be to go back to the planning commission with some recommendations and, um, and get some uh, input from them or decisions from them that would come on to the back to the city council at some point later in the year. Um, the next item is the short term rental program. Um, as we're all aware the council uh, adopted a ordinance last year, um, also gave uh, authority to the staff to sign a contract with host compliance to monitor that. That's in the, the contracts in place. We anticipate it to be fully operational in March or April of this um, uh, year. Uh, this will be handled through the community development department. We do have a, a meeting set up uh, with the subcommittee on a couple of uh, implementation issues and monitoring issues uh, that we will then bring back to the full council for uh, consideration. Um, hopefully, um, I'm anticipating that will be uh, a March, April uh, timeframe. Um, the next one also, um, item kind of got derailed by the uh, um, uh, COVID-19, um, you know, with the, certainly the effects that, uh, that this event has had on uh, any kind of retail uh, and any kind of storefront operations. Um, so this has been put on hold. Uh, there is a sub council subcommittee that has been working on this. Uh, we would anticipate uh, getting the subcommittee back um, again um, later on in the year uh, to review this and, um, and then ultimately make recommendations before they come back uh, to um, the planning commission and to the city council. Um, the next item you saw, um, the grading ordinance you saw last um, fall, um, and then um, we did bring it back to the council. Uh, we brought it to a subcommittee, and then we brought it to the, the council. Um, there is also some input from the planning commission. Uh, the council requested that we wait until um, after the new council was in place before we brought it back for consideration. So we will be doing that probably um, and um, I think we may be doing that as early as the next meeting, um, but we'll certainly be doing it uh, within the next month or so. Um, small lot garage exemption, the council, when they reviewed this issue a few months ago, um, asked that uh, an update on the ordinance to include a small lot grant a garage exemption and to provide some data on um, uh, just how uh, widespread or the, uh, the ordinance would affect um, the uh, exclusion. So that will be coming back to you um, probably in March. Um, the next item is um, affordable housing uh, strategy. Um, this is really kind of a rose from the uh, subcommittee uh, work on this. Um, we uh, obviously we've got, um, you know, issues relative to the baylands that will be coming on. And I think we want to look through some potential issue or uh, strategies there. We do have a 15% uh, inclusionary ordinance, but we may wanna uh, look at um, that as well as other uh, potential options. The other issue that has kind of been uh, vexing for us over many years is that uh, um, even though we've had 
um, some land available and we have had some interest in trying to do affordable housing projects. What invariably takes place is that the um, 14 affordable housing uh, nonprofit developers need uh, much greater density than you know our community is going to feel comfortable with. So it's been very difficult to find projects of a size <coughs> that um, that would work. Um, so the uh, idea here is that if, um, if that's not going to be uh, successful, then maybe come back with some other options for us to consider in terms of uh, of, um, of affordable housing that could be any array of things. I and mean, we've done first time buyer home buyer programs before um, and things of that nature. So there's, we just kind of want to look at the array of options that we have um, that we could potentially use. Um, the next item has um, uh, the utility rate uh, increases for capital projects and operations. This has already been before the council um, infrastructure subcommittee. Um, just to re <coughs> refresh everybody's um, memory, um, we have been on a program, um, I think, for over a decade now to um, uh, every five years do a bond issue for about $5 million uh, to increase um, or to raise funds for our uh, water and sewer infrastructure. Uh, so we're at the point where we are ready uh, to do that. Again, um, when we get, uh, when ultimately the city gets to the fourth or fifth cycle of, um, of doing this, then we'll be retiring bonds and then bringing in new new debt. And so there, at some point, the, um, the level of increase will be very, very minimal. Um, and that's the whole idea is to be able to have a kind of a steady um, program in terms of our capital projects so that we're getting the work done and we're not having a, a rate shock every few years. Next item um, has been on your agenda recently, and that is the, uh, <coughs> the airport park planning. Um, we are um, working uh, um, in the process of developing a, um, a, a much more robust committee um, set up with uh, um, the various um, committees of the city that uh, might have an interest, such as parks and rec, open space, um, complete streets, um, and uh, be uh, bringing on a consultant to help us with the, the planning and also um, any interaction that we may ultimately want to have with um, the UPC hotel site. Um, we're anticipating, <coughs> excuse me, we're anticipating that they will be coming through um, with some, if not their application, at least some more um, detailed ideas of what they want to do with the hotel site. So that this is a process that's in, in, um, in, in action at this point. Um, the last one is the Baylands development. And before I go to that, because we have another whole sheet um, to uh, review with you there. Uh, first of all, I need to get a glass of water, but beyond that, um, we, we, uh, it's probably a really good time to take a moment and receive any council input on what we provided you, um, but also for you to identify items that you would like to get uh, on the list. So with that said, I'll turn it back to the mayor and let the mayor um, moderate this part of it. Right. And I'm, um, I'm just gonna leave the room just for a moment. I'll be right back. Uh, I was trying to offer you a glass. But <laughs> like, so um, th this is a huge list of things for us to contemplate. I'm, I'm thinking that what would be really prudent for us to do is not try and get down into the weeds in tonight's meeting about any one particular topic here, but just make general comments on how you feel about the overall um, list of things that, that are here for us to do. Um, you, you know I'm very conservative relative to, to not um, putting us in a position to make promises that we can't keep. And, and I think that's super important. So if we have a high level overview of all of these topics, rather than getting into specifics that we say we're going to do, and then at some point in the future, we can't do, um, I think would be a very prudent start to this conversation. So who would like to start? Terry wants to start, I can see it in her face. 
Well, not really. I think that, uh, thank you. Um, and I think that uh, Carolyn's presentation of our past accomplishments and Clay's synopsis of what is on our plate or proposed to be on our plate was very good. I think that it really hit a lot of the larger projects that we're gonna be dealing with, um, certainly in a um, big overview rather than what the specifics of each project will be. Um, so right at this point, I don't have any other projects that I feel need to be added in a particular sense at this time, but um, I'd love to hear from the rest of the council. Okay, I'm just gonna go across the page since we've now got this, this graphic, I can, I can do numbers. Madison, you're next. I feel like this list seems manageable to me. Um, I feel like I don't. I don't think there's anything missing, um, and it all seems to be like stuff we could conceivably work on this year. So I don't. I'm kind of like Terry. I don't really have anything to add. Okay, Colleen. Uh, yeah, I. I think that the list is formidable enough. Um, couple things, the holiday lighting and beautification. I, I wonder about finances, but that's kind of an ongoing issue we have to address. So um, the rest looks fine. We may have other things that come up, but um, I'd rather stay with what I think is manageable right now. So it's good. All right, thanks. Cliff. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, I thought it was a great list. Uh, you know, things that we have been talking about, other things that have uh, you know come on our radar. Um, I, I did provide uh, a list of a few things uh, to Clay this morning, and I guess Clay, you, those are the things that you were gonna put in on the screen. Um, I, I don't think we have them ready for the screen, but I do. I do have. Uh, I do have your memo or not memo, but your email right here. Um, and uh, I can go through those items. Some of them, um, Cliff and I talked this afternoon, some of them are things that are kind of already in place um, or already going to be worked on, but they're just not implemented at the moment. And um, one of them was, sorry, I thought I had it right here at the top. I'm not finding it. You want me to mention them, Clay? Or uh... yeah, you if you got them off the top of your head, yeah, no, okay. no sense waiting on me. <laughs> you know what? No I, Cliff, I don't want you to read that whole list because it's kind of a compilation of things that we've all talked about. Uh, you know, Madam Mayor, it's 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 different than what you think. Wait, I, I, I didn't send that that email to you. Wait, so if there's things that we didn't talk about that you want to add to the list, great. Th thank you, Madam Mayor. And you know, um, you, you, and I like, like to me when I look at the the goals, um, I mean, there could be things that uh, we've we've you know, okay, here's our wish list type goals, or we could just be saying, hey, th in 2021, here are some things that we hope to to accomplish. And so, um, you know, and a lot of these goals also came from our advisory groups. And I just want to acknowledge all the hard work that, that they do in, in making their recommendations. You know, one, one of which, and in, in Clay, uh, I hope you can provide, uh, you know, just an update. You know, one of the things that we, um, we took that recommendation from Complete Streets and Safety in regards to the no U-turn on Bayshore and, um, you know, having that, that uh, arm extension across Bayshore so people don't make that, uh, that very dangerous U-turn, you know, on, on, in that um, in that intersection. So Clay, we're going to get that uh, hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, sometime in 21. Yeah, it, it, it's uh, it's it's in the in the works. Um, it's funded. It's approved. Um, it's just a matter of getting it uh, here and installed. So um, I don't have a specific time frame. Um, I know uh, Randy and I have talked about this a couple of times, but it shouldn't be too far into the future. Um, if, if I could just take a second, I know uh, Colleen brought up, a, I think, a, a good point in terms of how we 
uh, present this material. We, we didn't really mention any of your boards and commissions that who were uh, involved in all this stuff. And I think that's a, a, a good point. I think we'll go back and, and, um, and probably uh, make that uh, clear that, you know, the pro projects that they were involved in, um, you know, all the, 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 uh, the stuff that Cl uh, Caroline was showing on the uh, Safe Stro Streets program was all uh, run through the complete street. So we'll, we'll make that uh, adjustment and make it clear that, uh, you know, make it clear where the boards and commissions were involved in all this stuff. I think it's a, a good idea. Yeah, yeah, and, 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 and in that vein, um, you know, we know that, that the folks that volunteer uh, for these groups, I mean, they, they do it because of love of community. And, um, you know, and it's, it's interesting. I mean, I know we all respect the work that they do, but, but I think it would be nice if we had a day of recognition for them. Obviously, right now, during the COVID uh, pandemic, you know, it's, it's not really appropriate in, in like a gathering sense. But I, I think is, is a goal, maybe having some kind of recognition day for them. Um, and, you know, I mean, I, I guess we could do it online, uh, but, you know, maybe it, later in the summer, um, things might be good enough to do a social distancing thing at our new library if, if it's open. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to put that out there to, to our, our council members and see if that is um, something a goal that, that we should do to, you know, honor our, our advisory group um, who volunteer for us. You guys don't have to say anything if you don't want. I mean, we <laughs> just put it out there. Um, you know, another thing that, that's, that's really exciting about 2021 is the Crocker Park um, uh, Trail Master Plan. And so uh, I, I don't know if any of you went to the last meeting, but it was a great meeting and uh, excellent public input, um, open space and, and the planning, I mean, the park and rec department are do or commission are doing a great job, you know, working together uh, with uh, our park and rec staff um, to solicit that community input. Um, you know, we did get that money to do the, um, to repurpose the trail with the, the compressed granite. And so, um, I, I, I think those funds are now available. Is, is that true, Clay or Randy? Maybe you can uh, provide some input on that or, or could we see something? Can I, interject, can I interject for a second, Cliff? Yeah. I think we're trying to keep this as a 30,000 feet overview. Um, I, well, I, I, I don't see what's wrong with that, Madam Mayor. I'm just asking, uh, you know, I mean, these are, these are important things in our community. What, what's wrong with that? Thank you. I mean, so Clay, do you have uh, any input on that? I, I'm sorry. Could you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So the um, you know the repurposing of the Crocker Park Trail. I know we have we got that grant funding. Oh, the grant funding. Waiting yeah. for it. So or, you know, is that something that could happen in 2021, or is that perhaps a 2022? That's um, that's probably a 2022. Um, the funding on that is that kind of came through a, a regional agency. Um, and and all the get back to your previous question on the uh, arm on the Bayshore for the signal uh, that should uh, be fairly soon now because we did get uh, uh, quotes from a contractor this week on that so we should be ready to get that implemented pretty quickly. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, that, that that'll be it. Thanks. Okay. Um, the under item C council goal setting, are there any other comments we should be bringing forward right now? Tom, did we miss something? We, we do need to take a uh, public comment. It went a little longer than that, so please be sure to take that. Okay. Um, don't have it on my list, so... Um, Ingrid, is there any public comment on anything that we have said so far? Um, hey, Ingrid, I cut somebody off um, to, so Clay can finish. That's what I'm referring to. Oh, sorry. We have um, Linda Detmer who has raised her hand for public comment. Linda?
I see an L. Hello. Hi. Um, is this the appropriate time for public comment? I guess so. This is all new and I, I do apologize if we have made some errors. This is a, a new format, so. Understandable. Is um, the job for to go, Linda, tomorrow morning, there'll be a bullhorn in front of City Hall. You can do it there. Your choice. I can do that. Sorry for cutting <laughs> out to do that. <laughs> I want to thank Clay and Cliff and Colleen for acknowledging Complete Streets. And um, it's really important to me. I have been a part of that committee for about six years now. And um, I love it. And I want to see us retain members. There was actually several months where we couldn't get a quorum together to move forward on any of the work that we did, which I consider very important work. And I also recall initially when I became a part of the committee, wondering if we were not just a committee in name um, in order to sign for grants. And I decided to stick with it anyway, although at the time I felt very disappointed because this committee feels like the foster child of all the committees and uh, commissions. Um, We've done an awful lot of work. And I noticed that on the agenda, we were not acknowledged at all. We were not listed uh, to help with uh, the Sierra Point project or the Baylands project. That was an afterthought. Um, Public Works has taken the majority of the credit for hours and hours and hours of work done by this committee that I love. And right now we have some brilliant people on our committee. My main objective is not to gain any acknowledgement of myself, but to retain the talent that we have right now. It's incredible. And I would really like to see Complete Streets treated like a real committee. And that's all I have to say and thank you. Um, if, if, no, you know, no, 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 no. I actually, I, I would like to speak first here. Right? Right, sure. So, Linda, you, uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, okay. So, I have honored the Complete Streets Safety Committee for a long time, and I find it one of the most important local things that we can do. Um, I've been working on it. I, I don't think we're winning this year, but I don't think we're winning this year for, for reasons that are not because people are not um, honoring the Complete Streets Safety Committee. Um, I, th I think there's just been so many other things going on, but um, the uh, rubric that shows that we want uh, Complete Streets on every other major committee is, is in the works. And if you could just be patient, I'm really sorry you feel this way. And there was a, a mistake and a couple of pieces of information that came out, but you have my 100% support. And I think that um, Complete Streets is one of the most important things that we have locally. So um, can you take that to heart? I can, Karen, and thank you very much. And just so you know, uh, committee members have been out even during COVID doing a parking survey and looking at bioswales and um, doing our best. And it, it just, I brought it up a couple of times in committee that, you know, uh, Open Space and Ecology gets to do a presentation and again, going back to my main point is retention. When people are acknowledged, they want to stay. And we are losing people left and right, applying for other commissions and council positions and whatever. And I'm just at the point where if we're not needed, if all we are is a name to get grants, I don't want to do this anymore. No, you're needed. Uh, um, let, let me... Let me let the other council members speak, please. Thank you. Thank you. Madison. Um, I'm so sorry that 
and that you feel that way, Linda. I think that one of maybe the places that we could start is calling a meeting between your council liaisons and um, your committee. I know that there were some concerns in the past and we had a meeting, but this was probably like three or four years ago. And um, we should really be meeting fairly regularly, at least, at least annually with your uh, council liaisons. And I think that that's a really great opportunity for us to have one-on-one -on -one time with you, for you to um, talk to us about what you're working on and maybe some challenges that you're having. And for us to, you know, figure out like the best ways that we can support you and, um, you know, what recognition looks like to you. And so I think that might be the best forum to do that and, and to just make that commitment that we do that regularly so that you have that time to, to just, you know, communicate these things that are going on instead of letting them bubble up and then people are getting upset or people are leaving and maybe there's just things that we just don't know, you know? So that's where I would suggest we start first. Thank you. Anybody else want to comment here? Cliff? Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, yeah, sorry, uh, Linda, that you're feeling that way. And I, I just wanted to echo what the mayor had said, um, that you guys are very, very important and you do play a vital role in helping the council um, you know, with your recommendations on how we, we navigate in our community. And there's some just wonderful, wonderful examples in our town that um, you know those things have happened because of the efforts that you and and your colleagues have have put in. Um, so uh, one of the things that we did talk about, I think, it was at our last meeting, and in, in, in Clay and Council, excuse me if I if I if I didn't hear that correct, but uh, when we were looking at um, getting uh, advisory group representation for Sierra Point for choosing a, a, you know, a consultant, we were looking at all of the uh, advisory groups, not just Park and Rec and, and OSEC, but also Complete Streets, yeah. it, 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 right? So, um, yeah, it's so I mean- in the agenda, unfortunately. Yeah, and I, 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 you know, sorry that that was not in there, but I, I'm sure staff will be reaching out to your body to ask, you know, for someone to, um, to you know, volunteer and, and, and be a part of that because it you know you you can't create a master park uh uh you know a master park plan with you know without having uh complete streets you know be in the mix so thank you for your work any other comments colleen i think we could all do a better job on the council of finding different projects for complete streets to do. I think they're underutilized in many ways. They've created a lot of their own projects, but uh, when we talk even about connectivity with the ridge, I don't know that we've ever examined how to make people on the ridge connect more. And complete streets isn't just about traffic. It's also about creating walkable communities and community spaces and um, biking and a lot of landscape aspects. So I think we need to take a hard look at some other projects that um, they certainly are more than capable of doing. And, and I don't know that that's been done for a long time. Probably not. Um, anybody else? So Karen, um, thank you. I just want to echo, you know, a lot of what has been said by the other council members that um, it's very important to recognize members of the different um, committees and commissions. And certainly Complete Streets has been overlooked in some of the accolades and what's been done, um, or at least their names haven't been put out there. Um, but they do play an important role and something that the city really needs. and we will be looking to them for direction on projects. Absolutely. So thank you. 
right, thanks. So I, I did give direction to staff earlier that um, that complete streets needed to be added to our um, table um, for looking at what we're doing moving forward. So and I know that has been changed. Um, Ingrid, do we have any changed um, okay. that we can show people now? Claire, are you ready to do the next set of Yeah, okay. if, we're, if we're ready. Well, I, probably a good time to move forward. If, if those changes would be made, I, that, I would welcome them. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure they are. All right, thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks, Linda. So the next item um, is the um, uh, Baylands uh, development. The, uh, the council had a conversation about this a couple weeks ago. <clears throat> so this is a, a little bit of a follow-up to that. Um, this is coming from your um, uh, committee, um, the Baylands um, um, subcommittee members, which are uh, council members, Lance and Mayor uh, Cunningham. Um, and uh, their idea is to uh, enlarge the committee so that it is uh, the two council members, uh, one member of the Planning Commission, one member of Parks and Rec, one member of OSEC, um, Public Arts Commission, um, and then um, also one member of, um, of um, the Complete Streets Committee. And I apologize, we didn't have that on there. Um, so I, I'll take the, the fall on that one. Um, the idea is the, um, uh, that this committee will be meeting um, approximately once a month with the uh, applicant uh, prior to um, their uh, submitting a specific plan. So this probably will be anywhere from four to six months would be the guess. Uh, could be longer, uh, it's kind of hard to say for sure. Um, but uh, would um, review kind of status with the uh, developer, um, make suggestions in terms of uh, uh, material and information that they need to bring forward. For example, we, we've already requested the developer develop a 3D model uh, so that we have a better kind of spatial sense of what they're looking at, at the, on the project site. Um, they're gonna probably have that ready for the council in, uh, or for the uh, subcommittee in March. Um, and also to help kind of um, hone down some of the kind of key questions around some of these areas. Um, at the last meeting that the council had this discussion, um, you had, uh, uh, I think, uh, made it very clear that um, policy direction to the developer uh, needed to come back to the full council for the full council to have some uh, discussion uh, about that. Um, and that, um, you also wanted to have, make sure that you had a robust uh, public input process. And that's part of the thinking behind having uh, each of the members of the uh, various committees um, come in and, and participate in these, uh, in these subcommittee meetings. Now, um, the one thing I want to make clear so that there's no confusion on is that at a later point in the process, you'll probably be asking each one of your uh, subcommittees to review certain aspects of the development. You'll probably be asking them to review the specific plan as well as um, the uh, environmental uh, CEQA docu documents. This does not preclude that. This is in addition to that. And that's work that their entire committees would do. This would just simply be a member of their committees participating in this. Uh, process. Um, and again, we anticipate this going on for the next few months, kind of pre-application. Uh, once we get an application in, you, you know, uh, we will certainly have been starting the, the CEQA process and then ultimately to the planning commission. So I don't see this subcommittee uh, continuing on um, after that point, except if there's some other mission for it to, to, to do so, you know, certainly we'll evaluate it at that point in time. But for right now, the whole point of this is just to um, help kind of understand what the developer is looking at, um, kind of ask some questions, get a wide uh, uh, diversity of people um, involved in the process. And uh, hopefully that will strengthen um, their application and uh, provide uh, kind of an additional layer of uh, public review on uh, what's, uh, what's taking place. Um, with that, I think, um, Councilmember uh, Lentz and uh, Mayor Cunningham, 
were involved in the development of this. So I'll let them make any additional comments that they'd like. Sure. And um, go back to just, all right, Cliff, go ahead. Make your comment. All right. Well, um, yeah, you know, it was great getting your, your feedback, you know, at the last meeting. And um, I know Colleen, you, you really wanted to have, you know, Cliff, more Cliff, hands. Stop, stop. Oh. Who, who is your, is that me? Is that stop? No, no, the, can, the, the council at our last meeting, just okay. the feedback that we got from the council. Okay, you said your, so just be. Oh, that, that's what I meant, the, uh, the, I'm talking to the council. Right, so yeah, so the council, I'm sorry, I didn't say council feedback. I apologize, Madam Mayor. Yes. So, um, Clear. yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, no council feedback, right? And, and so, you know, we, you know, uh, the mayor and I, you know, took that feedback to heart and trying to, you know, come up with a, 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 a game plan so that we as a council could have more input together and, you know, and giving that feedback to the developer as they're in that process of creating the specific plan rather than, um, you know, just getting the, the, the specific plan cold, right? Without really direction from us. And then, you know, that, that's always such an uphill, you know, battle sometimes when there isn't that involvement. And, and then, you know, Madison, um, you, you know, you talked about, you know, that you, you really wanted that public input. And, um, you know, the, the folks that, that sit on these advisory groups, I mean, they, they're the they're the members of the public that, that get even more involved than than the regular public members, and so it just seems uh, appropriate to to bring in their expertise and and and, and that that additional public input that um, is really valuable in, in our decision making process. So um, yeah, hopefully you, you guys are, are are cool with adding these additional members to to the Baylands committee. Comments. So I just, I, I'm just wanting to make sure that when the when this um, Baylands committee is meeting with the developer, they're making some suggestions um, on what would make the development better for the city and for the residents, um, but they're not making any promises that of items that will be or won't be approved until it gets reviewed at the entire city council level. That's correct. That, that's, I think that's a good description of it. I mean, in, in the, be clear that, you know, that the committee's not there to negotiate with the developer. It, it's just there to receive information, provide some observations, um, and getting, getting back to the 3D diagram, I think that was a really good idea that came out of uh, the committee to, uh, you know, to understand the project better. And I think, you know, I could see a lot of that kind of input to the developer that will help kind of, um, you know, facilitate the process. But all policy decisions, all policy directions, that will come from the full city council. Great, thank you. Madison, Colleen. I'm just trying to figure out what else we have to talk about. Like, I thought we went over the list. Everyone's good with the list. Okay, just want to make sure we've what got else? good with the list. I'm good with the list. Okay, that's why I was asking the question. All right, we're we good. No more questions. All right, so. Moving forward, uh, item four, mayor and council matters. Item D, provide comment and direction to PCE board representative on proposal to support legislation to allow greater flexibility for utility user taxes. Staff report. Um, this item was brought forward to you by your um, PCE council board member assign, assignee, uh, Colleen Mackin. So um, I'm gonna let Colleen kind of walk you through what the issue is and what direction she would like from, uh, from the council. 
Colleen, please, please let us know how you feel about this, please. Okay, well, first of all, um, I'll say that that mostly ministerial things I wouldn't bring back to you, but I felt this was something I didn't want to make a decision without input and some sort of consensus. So there was a Peninsula Clean Energy Board member under the, the intro guise was that he said COVID had um, made a hardship on a lot of cities in terms of revenues. And this was a way that cities could raise revenues. And the idea was that we would potentially have a gas tax. And some cities are already doing gas and electric taxes through PG&E, the bills. But as it is now, PG&E cannot separate gas and electric taxes. Now, why just a gas tax? Well, Peninsula Clean Energy, Renewables, Climate Change, um, there's a push to go all electric. And so taxing gas, the theory is to reduce gas appliances, heaters, go more towards all electric homes. So this board member felt this was a way to do it and raise revenues. Doesn't mean every city has to do a tax. It just would avail it because part of this would never take place unless we had a mandate from the state forcing Pacific Gas and Electric to change their billing software. Because right now they can't just raise a gas tax on a bill. So um, some cities had signed on to this, um, mostly Mountain View and Gilroy. I'm trying to think of where else, uh, Los Altos. But um, Josh Becker, was contacted by the same board member. And Josh said, well, I don't wanna take this to the state legislature unless there's a consensus that cities really want to do this. My thoughts on this were that maybe kind of an interesting idea and really bad timing. Uh, we have a recession, we have some people out of work, we have people trying to survive, pay their bills. Uh, realistically, a 5% increase, they estimate as a gas increase uh, on the bill of about $2.75, but that's kind of an average at 5%, and the range of the tax is estimated to be anywhere from 5% to 15% for some cities. And on top of that, we have renters who have no control over the utilities in their dwellings. So what would a landlord do with this? You think a landlord's going to suddenly say, well, I'm gonna change all your heating and your stove and everything over to electricity, I doubt it. So I think we're putting a hardship potentially on um, renters that they can ill afford right now and they have very little say in it. So why am I bringing it to you? I, I could easily just say, well, we're not gonna sign the petition. But I also felt we might want to consider something more proactive, which would be either to write to the board or to Josh Becker or both and simply express the counterpoint view because it's kind of a, a spiral of silence if people sign on and no one speaks up why this is a bad idea. So I really wanted to hear all of your thoughts. Well, I really feel aligned with you because, you know, I think about so many renters, like so, all my friends who rent, we live in old buildings, the gas heating and gas appliances. And so, and, and that these are the smallest, cheapest, most affordable units. Typically that haven't been, you know, newly updated and you got these old, you have you know, you have a lot of gas, gas appliances. And these are the people in these types of units are the people who can least afford for at least least afford, you know, increase in their utility bill, especially right now. So from my perspective, I say no. Terry, I'm so gonna... Cl Cliff, I'm not putting you at the end. I'm going across the board. Okay. <laughs> Terry. <laughs> Um, so Colleen, is it your understanding 
that um, if this were to go through and and it would be system wide for PG and E that they would have to adjust the their billing structure for all the cities, and that cost would only be passed on to cities that implemented tax, or it would be implemented into their rate flow through transmission or billing charges? Okay, really good question. The only way the tax would be implemented is if a city decided they wanted to levy the tax. Brisbane, for instance, could say, we're going to do a 5% gas tax. Colma could say, we want 20%. Um, South City could say, we want 10%. Someone else might say, we're not gonna do a tax at all. Everyone has the ability to either do the tax, whatever amount, or no tax. But what this is going to require, and I, and I can read this to you, the software modifications would have to be met by March 1st, 2022. And the amount included in the rate base would be the lesser of actual project costs to redo the software or $800,000. That's PG&E. So everybody, whether they do the tax or not, is authorizing PG&E probably to pass that, that amount along to convert all of their software. Did I and answer probably, I can't imagine they could convert all their software for that amount of money, but um, who knows? Um, the, other, the other part, if I can just mention as well, so if you're a renter, and let's say you have a landlord that goes, oh, I pay the gas and electric, which might be unusual. They might say, I'm going to start converting everything. I'm going to change the heater, the water heater, the stove. They also, in a lot of places without rent control, will just simply pass this on to their tenants. And we're at a time we're screaming about affordable housing. And I just think that this is kind of a, a, a great idea. We're thinking, let's, let's try to get off carbon, but people are doing that slowly on their own. The other thing is Peninsula Clean Energy has these enormous rebates right now that they're offering for converting your water heater or your furnace. But if someone has one that's still usable, my guess is they're not gonna get rid of it until it's time, myself included where we say, well, you know, when the water heater's time to go, it's time to convert to electric. And, th and that is a non-punitive way. And, and the upside is with all these rebates being offered, it, it's not punitive. I think this tax is a little bit punitive. Thanks, Colleen. Cliff? Yeah, I, I totally agree 100% with where you're going, Colleen. Um, and, and you, Madison, too, I'm glad you brought up, you know, how um, that that tax would would disproportionately affect you know, lower income folks. So, you know, they don't have choices, you know, many times. So um, eventually it's going to get phased out and we're moving in that direction in, in, in not a, like a slow way, but we're moving in a pretty good at a pretty good pace. So uh, I, I would not be in favor of, of doing that tax. Okay, so here, here's, here's the question for all of us. Um, so we are one of the cities that are the most far ahead in, in the green thing. We, we've won so many awards, et cetera. How do we, how do we deal with this? So. Before you answer, um, I I don't want to put any taxes on any of our renters either right now. I mean, that's just absurd at this time. But you know, looking at the fact that you know Brisbane is one of the most advanced um, cities relative to greening. How do we, give me a second, you guys, I'm tired. How do we compose the objection 
to making this happen at this time because yeah i'm i'm sure we all you know want the green things to happen as fast as possible but not right now so um did, did that make sense it's trying to make sense yeah no it makes sense you're trying to square it up right if we have a kind of this environmental um you know in, you know in like eco-friendly you know kind of persona of who we are and then we're not you know moving forward with this tax that may accelerate the the you know of not using you know natural gas I, you know i i don't think it, it, the tax is really going to make that much of a difference and and, and, it, and correct me if i'm wrong calling but it sounds like in this document it, it it's it's kind of like saying hey this is a way for cities to make some additional money it's like you know what come on you know right. what that's, that's <laughs> that, right. that should not be the reason okay. right Let let Colleen respond to that. That would be great. Ironically, Cliff, that's exactly how this board member introduced it. Is he said, you know, COVID has really, a lot of cities have taken a hit and here's a chance you can make up some revenues. And I thought, whoa, wait a minute, what are we doing here? And I, I think it had some people stunned a little bit because it, it it's a bit complicated. At first you go, oh, great, you know, we're going to try to promote all electric until you start thinking about it and you go, well, you know, is this really the, the way we're talking about essential services when you're talking about heat, hot water and cooking. And why would you hit essential services when we're trying to get legislation to help people during COVID who are unemployed and can't pay their rent and, and homeowners with mortgages who can't pay mortgages people unemployed well, why would we hit them right now with this okay so so looks like we're kind of fermenting into a really good position but terry madison need to come into this too because i think we can i think our city who has got platinum awards for so many things can probably come up with some really good language we need good language. Yeah, and I language, think that whatever it is, go. I go, think go. being a, a I, I, I don't think that we should sign on as a city to implementing this. And I think that if we state that the, you know, we have gone to, you know, all new electric construction and, you know, to that that is the way to limit gas usage. You know, natural gas is still in our communities. It still needs to be serviced. It may get to where it's, you know, inf unfeasible for whatever regulations, but, you know, it, it needs, it's still there. And I don't think we should penalize. So if we state in our letter that we are proactively against this because we feel that this can be addressed through planning and through um, non punitive methods of getting people off fossil fuels, I think that's a way to do it without sounding like we're reversing course on being a green community. Well, yeah, and and our poorer communities, for goodness sake. Yeah, that's what you have to say. You have to say that Brisbane has and always will be committed to, you know, to green initiatives, to being sustainable and to renewable energy. But we feel that this tax won't will hurt the poorest in our communities who really have no ability to change behavior anyway they're just going to end up like i i can't go and replace my heater and go and replace my stove i'm a renter i can't do that so it's not really going to move the needle anywhere it's just going to punish the people, why don't we, it's better to incentivize like my, my apartment complex to put in a place where we can charge our vehicles and do positive initiatives in that way. And as a city, you know, we're doing okay financially. So this is not, I don't think it's going to generate that much money for us to implement something like that. So I think so, you just lay out all those things. So, so can, can I just, just, 
Oh, can I just jump in here for a second and say, listen to what we were all saying. And is there something that we as a community can outside of this little gathering tonight can come together and talk about this because it was amazing information that that came forth but um, I, I'm I can't sign on to this as much as I'm a green person just put solar on my roof blah 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 but I can't um, I cannot tolerate the idea that we're gonna um, hurt the people in our communities that can least afford to, to bear the burden no I'm well what I think that that staff or Colleen is looking for now is direction and I think she can work with staff and perhaps legal or with um, you know on on getting the wording for the letter because it needs to go out pretty quick we're not going to hash it out the language tonight but no. I think she's looking for direction and staff can work with her to um, come up with something through um, our sustainable um, coordinator um, and get some language that isn't going to offend but makes it clear why we are not we're, promoting we're, this. Where we're at, for right. sure. Thank you. Is you that know, something, Clay, that we can give direction? For, yeah, for, for sure. That, that works from our end, yeah. Does that That's sound cool. legally and, and ethically and morally acceptable to everybody right here? Yes. One thing that you've not given me feedback on is there doesn't seem to be a deadline in this petition, but as we see from the people who've signed on other than one person from Gilroy, it's mostly affluent communities. So they may believe $3 on my bill isn't gonna make it or break it for me. Sure, let's go. But if this petition lingers for another month or so because I don't know how long they'll keep it open maybe until they feel they they have enough names is this letter to go to the peninsula clean energy board because they may close the petition in which case that petition will go right to Josh Becker or do we send a letter to the board and Josh Becker or do we send a letter directly to Josh Becker because he's the one that's going to get the petition Okay, question to Tom. Um, this is a statement of support or lack of support for a new, uh, effectively, this will be a state policy. It also might be seen as a bankruptcy court policy. I don't know if the final proceeding on the is closed. I haven't looked in at least 90 days. Um, so timing is only, uh, Relevant, relevant if, if you're trying to advance a state policy this year, then you're supposed to meet a deadline of um, the 19th for introducing the this month, 19th through 20th, whatever the Friday. We're not, we're not hearing you clearly, Tom. Could you? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay, sorry about that. Um, the policy deadline for legislation, which I think is what is essentially being called for, is the uh, third Friday this month. I believe it's the 19th. Uh, to have something written, to be ready to go, et cetera, with Senator Becker's um, support, this would have to be done very quickly, certainly no later than next week. That's if you want something. That's not what I'm hearing from the council. If you don't want something, then you can make a statement as you've um, outlined. You can be silent for the moment and see if the bill is actually introduced. You can send a, a letter like you outlined just to the Senator, which I think is what's being discussed. All of that's perfectly legal. And the only deadline you have to be concerned with is if you were actually advancing a policy uh, through the legislature. I, I just don't know, and Clay may know off top of his head or Stuart, um, Clay, do you know, I know the deal was struck on PG&E. Do you know if the hearing or the process is closed? I believe that's, it is. That's I thought yeah. it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah so I that's the other thing that could be impacted, but I don't think Senator Becker is going to get in the middle of a uh, a bankruptcy proceeding. So 
I think you're talking about the state legislature and sending a letter of what you believe is the right way to go to Senator Becker as your, your senator. And you, you may want to send it to Assemblymember Mullins as well. I, I think that would be our best course of action, but you know, I'm not an attorney. So I'm, I'm here for you guys to let me know how you feel about this, because I think it's really important that we're prudent and we're very conservative in our actions. So as not to incite a, a lawsuit of any description moving forward. So I think, um, you know, I've said it and I want to say it again, Keeping us as a low profile is, from my perspective, our best move forward, but I'm one vote, that's it. So you guys, if, let me know. If I may, Madam Mayor, of course. I, don't, I would not want the council to think there's a lot of service here. I, I don't know uh, how there would be for endorsing this policy or objecting the policy or simply just making a statement of principle, which is what I heard outlined. So I don't think you have to worry about a lawsuit. I do think, uh, as some of you know, individually from um, us talking over the years, um, legislators are very, very busy. And uh, when you ask them something as a city, you want to ask them something that the city cares about and that you feel strongly about. Otherwise, uh, providing information is great because they do want that input. They want to know what their constituents are thinking and particularly the elected officials in a, in a city like Brisbane where they're close to their constituents. Um, but they're not offended by it. They're not bothered by it at all. So there's no legal risk. You're not going to offend Senator Becker. Um, you're certainly not going to offend uh, uh, Pro Tem, uh, not Pro Tem, I'm sorry, um, Speaker Pro Tem um, Mullins. But uh, the question simply is, is this a big enough priority that um, you want to draw attention to it? And that's really, that's that's a sense of, of the five of you, whatever you agree. I think that like we've given Colleen direction, she can take it back to the meeting. This might not end up being something like the feedback at PC might be, you know, I clearly so many cities don't want to, don't want to pursue this and it dies there. So I think that we might be doing like too much right now and just like let Colleen go to the meetings, feel it out, make her position known. I I assume there's gonna be a ton of discussion. And then if we feel like this is moving forward, then at that point we can figure out like what strategy we wanna have. If I may, I, I don't know that this is going to come back again, Madison. That's my concern. Since mm -hmm. this this is not this is not being submitted as a as a uh, motion for the the whole PCE board to get behind. It, it's more or less a a consensus that this one person wants to provide Josh Becker. And when it got brought up at the meeting, he made his spiel, and that was it. There were no comments. We went right past it because it's one person's initiative. So my concern was if if we do not sign on it, there's a, a silence, and. Do we want to at least just say that that it's a good intention, but that it has some ramifications perhaps were never considered and that there are some better incentives to get people to move on to electric? Very simple. And I don't think I'll have an opportunity at, an, at another board meeting to make that, that point because I don't think it's coming back on our agenda again. Okay, so Colleen um, did not sign on. I so, don't think we have to like explain it. I don't know. So Tom, if for what it says in this um, letter is that they would need to um, move it forward in this legislative season, would you get wind of that if they were trying to do that? Yeah, I, we would certainly know that the we would. No, by March at the latest. Uh, and I should, if I may, uh, Council Member O'Connell, um, <laughs> thank God for the internet. So the proceeding on uh, the PUC closed out the entire round. The court had acted, but the PUC did close out the proceeding on pg and &E on October 26, 2020. So this is purely a state legislative um, play at the moment. And uh, yes, Mayor, uh, former Mayor O'Connell, we would get wind of it. Um, and I must say that utility user taxes are uh, 
um, hotly contested, very controversial because they have to be very carefully worded. And not only will we hear a word of it, but if it has any chance of moving forward, uh, there'll be people coming out of the woodworks uh, with views on it, different views on it, positive and negative, different ideas, things like that. And this is that. So it, it would not be an easy pass through the legislation. No. So we have time. If we just ignore this and stay silent, we would have time to weigh in or lobby one way or another at a later date. Yes, and if, if anybody tried to impose this on pg &E, it would immediately be a question of the <laughs> what about the other IOUs, the investor-owned utilities like sdg and &E and Edison? Then the next question would be, well, what about the municipals like uh, SMUD and, and uh, LADWP? It, this will be quite a debate. Uh, so yes, you will have plenty of opportunity to win. And Howard Jarvis and all those other people would get involved and so. everybody. Okay. Great. Okay. Any other comments? So have we given Colleen direction enough for her? Colleen, we're, you good? we're not going to sign the petition in favor and we're going to just sit on it and wait for further word. Are you comfortable with that? Sure. That's that's the input I wanted. Cliff, your fingers up your nose. Are you okay? I'm no, it's on my face, uh, Madam Mayor. So <laughs> sorry about that. Thank you for uh, calling that out. So um, yeah, I mean, it's it, it's not really Colleen's decision. It's our decision. Do we want to sign I, the petition or not? To, right. I want to make sure so. everybody's everybody's cool. Madison, any other comments? No. Okay. All right. So. Looks like we we know where we're going. Okay, so let me moving on to item four, mayor and council matter matters. Item D, provide comment and direction to PCE board representatives on proposal to support legislative uh, legislation to allow greater flexibility for utility users tax. I think we. Kind of got that. Yeah. 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 All right, we're done. All right. Um, item five, public comment. Ingrid. There are no members of the public wishing to make a public comment. Before we adjourn, are there any other comments? Colleen has do, right. do you want a subcommittee report? I can give you a quick, there is one item of Peninsula Clean Energy that, that's a really good thing. I think we need to have that on February 18th. Okay, I'll save it. I'll save it because that's when that's it. All right, nothing else. Thank you, everybody can go to bed. Adjournment to the regular, regular city council meeting of February 18th. Thanks everybody. Good night. Thank you. Good night.